Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Bendix booth. Our first tech talk is on what's new in air disc brakes. My name is Gary Ganaway. I'm the director of marketing and global product support uh, with Bendix Spicer. I'm going to be talking to you about air disc brakes. Uh, how many of you are familiar with disc brakes? Are you at all? Okay, very good. Um, one of the things uh, new in our industry uh, is reduced stopping distance. And uh, just prior to August of 2011, uh, the requirement was that heavy trucks, uh, 59,600 pounds and below, uh, had to stop uh, within 355 feet. The government didn't think that was good enough, uh, not nearly close enough to where passenger cars were. Typical passenger cars around 140 feet. So how do we reduce that number? How do we make heavy trucks safer? So a couple of ways that we can do that. Uh, one is with the higher performing drum brakes, which we have on display, uh, also are in the booth. Uh, but to get the optimal performance, the solution is really air disc brakes, okay? So, and why do we do that? So if we look at the torque output of the various brake designs, prior to reduced stopping distance, most heavy trucks on the steer axle had the 15 by four brake outputting about 6,200 pound feet of torque. So then we go to a larger drum brick, which was better yet, but only output about 7,500. Made the change to a higher performing RSD brake, we jumped up to 9,500, excellent performance, but for air disc brakes, still at 10,500. Actually the optimal solution. The other benefit of air disc brakes, ironically, is significantly lower fade, and uh, Dwayne will talk about some of the other benefits, but quick change, Pads, as an example, the fact that they're lubed and sealed for life, and really uh, offer a level of performance much beyond anything a drum brake is, uh, is capable of. So, what's happened with air disc brakes? If you've been in the industry for a while, there's been a lot of discussion around when air disc brakes would take off. We at Bendix went into production uh, in the mid-2000s to around 2005. We made a grand total of about 1,900 air disc brakes. And as the years went on, you can see that we got a little bit better, a little bit better. But the momentum around reduced stopping distance really began to build. Uh, we at Bendix took a lot of questions from fleets and a really you know, great discussion around performance, brakes. CSA also played a part as fleets became very interested in, in safety going forward. So lo and behold, in 2010, we nearly doubled our production, went to about 52,000. And then around reduced stopping distance, those volumes took off. So that's really the driving force between uh, air disc brakes, a little bit about them. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dwayne, who will go through uh, some of the technical features. Dwayne? Thank you, Gary. Good morning. As Gary uh, introduced, uh, my name is uh, Dwayne Evans, the uh, technical sales manager for disc brakes. Um, disc brakes have been out for a variety of years now, five to six years, uh, on a lot of the heavy truck platforms. So from a service perspective, once you get the wheels off of the vehicle, the key thing to look at, I need to have that running clearance in the brake. I keep coming back to that, but we should have about a millimeter of clearance, so with the brakes released, you should be able to grab that caliper and get a slight wiggle or, or you know that free play in the caliper. And that's going to indicate, number one, that the brake is not dragging, and as long as we don't have too much play, you know, we're not, uh, not in, in risk of being out of adjustment. So once we uh, verify that we do have that free play in the caliper, which is the very first thing, whether you're looking for troubleshooting, you're just doing your regular PM, uh, we do give it a slight wiggle. Uh, the other things to look at, either be concerned about from a roadside inspection and or a, uh, a PM, is do I have pad material and do I have rotor? So obviously with the wheels off, it's very easy to see. Uh, we do have two pads here. Um, you know, from a service perspective, when it comes time to change them, it's as simple as putting a little bit of pressure on the pad retainer bar, removing the pad retainer bar and the pin, and then the pads just slide right out of the caliper. In this case, we have a brand new uh, pad here. It's 30 millimeters thick overall. When it comes time to service your pads, we can wear these pads down all the way to about two millimeters of friction material left, which happens to be about the thickness of that coin in your pocket. So brand new, fully thick pad. And if we look at a fully worn pad, you know, so it's significantly different than that of a, a drum brake shoe. So once we take the pads out, um, we expose the rotor. Um, as far as life of the rotor, a brand new rotor is 45 millimeters thick, fully worn is 38. 
One advantage of the, uh, the Bendix rotor from a visual perspective is we have a chamfer on the outer edge of the rotor. And when it comes time, when that chamfer is basically worn away and you have a, a right angle on the edge of the rotor is a very good indication of when it's time to get in with that micrometer and take a, a more accurate reading to, to find out if the brake needs servicing. So once we get our new pad, it's as simple as you know, dropping it back in the, uh, the caliper. I um, have my uh, rotor spacer here. Once we uh, put our pad retainer bar and our pin back in place, basically we just completed an entire brake job in a couple of minutes versus that half hour to 45 minutes it can take with the drum brake. From a manual adjustment standpoint, uh, really isn't needed any time during the life of the brake. You know, when we do take out the pads and put new pads in, we do have a manual adjustment on the back side of the caliper. It's covered by a rubber boot, a grommet, and on the back side we have a 10 millimeter hex. Simply with your uh, 10 millimeter wrench, once we put in the new pads, we want to snug those pads up tight to take up all that free play or running clearance and then back it off two clicks. So much like the, the sound you see in adjusting an automatic slack adjuster, you hear that click, click, click as you back off a slack adjuster. Just hear that same kind of click or pressure when you're uh, backing this off to get you that free running clearance of the caliper. Um, and once you do that, you're set to go. The vehicle's, you've done a complete brake job and the vehicle is ready to go. Um, as far as looking at it from a maintenance troubleshooting perspective, there's three things, I guess, to, to look for. You know, if we're looking at for pad wear that's abnormal. Number one, are both pads wearing at the same rate? Um, if we have both pads wearing at the same rate, Typically, it's something with the you know, pneumatic system, the slide mechanism of the brake itself. And uh, so not only do we have to, we pull that first wheel end off, we look at the pads, we have to evaluate, is this, pad, is this particular wheel end wearing at the same rate as all the other wheel ends out of my vehicle, or is it only this one wheel end? Um, typically, if it's, say, all four brakes on a tandem, it's probably more likely a pneumatic problem. If it's one particular wheel end that's wearing at a higher or faster rate than the others, you know, I would focus strictly on that wheel end to find out what's going on. But one of the keys, once again, to go back is that free running clearance. When we notice abnormal pad wear, um, we want to grab that caliper and make sure that's sliding freely. If we do remove the pads, this caliper will slide inboard and outboard about an inch. And it should only take just a couple of fingers of force to slide this caliper a little bit. If it takes more than that to, to move the caliper, if you get a push on it, something isn't proper with the, uh, with the slideability of that caliper and we're gonna experience issues. So it is key that this thing be able to slide just with a couple of fingers of force. So we talked a little bit about both pads wearing at the same rate. Um, two other uh, scenarios that may be seen is one if you have outboard pad wear. Um, typically if the outer pad on the vehicle is wearing faster than the inboard, we have something that's causing that caliper to not release once we let our foot off that brake pedal. So the caliper is staying inboard, so whether it's a, a slide mechanism that's not sliding freely, maybe even a jounce hose that's attached to the, the air chamber itself that's pulling the caliper inboard, constantly causing this outboard pad to be dragging against the rotor. However, if we consider pad wear on the inboard pad, different, typically it's a different phenomenon that's causing that situation. One of the most common ones we see out there is from road uh, you know, debris, uh, spray from dust, grit if you're doing a lot of uh, gravel roads, uh, a lot of uh, chipped highways. Um, sometimes we'll see more of that when you have the inboard pad wear. So based on the, the wear patterns and the disc brakes, we can definitely get a good feel for what's going on and what's causing our problem. Um, so I guess just to kind of back up, just kind of summarize, you know, for, as far as the disc brake goes, you know, it's very simple. It is different. We just want to get the word out um, on how simple it is. But as long as we have, once again, that, that millimeter-ish of uh, running clearance and the, the free play, um, you should have no problems. And uh, we're seeing about roughly double the life um, out of any drum brake you'd be running given a, a particular route, particular driver, particular truck. We should be able to double the mileage. And if we're not seeing that, it's something we need to take a look at your wheel end and the things we just covered. So I guess with that, thank you for your attention. If anybody has any further questions, uh, please uh, let us know. Thank you.